For hundreds of great shows like this one, go to onnetworks.com. If you play enough video games, you eventually start to see a language and a set of rules they all play by, and you know you don't need to read the instruction booklet anymore. You just uh, you can start playing the game, and uh, you kind of figure things out as you go. It's kind of like filmmaking, where there's certain rules of editing and composition, and you have to go back to the early, early filmmakers, like D.W. Griffith or later Orson Welles, to find the guys who really made those rules that we all follow today. In video games, the guy who's responsible for all this is Shigeru Miyamoto. Shigeru Miyamoto was hired by Nintendo in 1977. They hired him to design the artwork that goes on the side of game cabinets. Yeah, he worked as a staff artist. He's intellectually curious, always seeing what was going on. And then in 1979, he actually had his first shot at designing a game. At this point, Nintendo's trying to break into America, and so they try to do this with a game called Radar Scope. Now, it didn't go over so well, so they ended up having like a few thousand of these cabinets left. So, you know, in desperation, they looked at this, you know, young artist and said, hey, you know what, you want to make a game? We got all these Radar Scope machines, see what you can do. We got nothing else to lose. Take all these radar scope parts. We got the cabinets, the joysticks, the screens. Just reprogram them. Make your own game. Let's see what happens. So Miyamoto gets to work, and pff, out comes Donkey Kong. We all know the history. Donkey Kong became a huge smash internationally, right? But what it did that was even more important was actually establish a new genre for video gaming, the platformer. A platform game, basically the name comes from the idea of jumping from platform to platform. And you want to jump over obstacles, you want to jump to avoid falling off the edge. It just became a huge new way to play games. Pretty much until games really got a third dimension and became 3D, jumping really defined video games. It was about one third of all games were platformers. In fact, the protagonist of Donkey Kong, even though we now know him as Mario, was originally named Jumpman. Because that's what he did, he jumped. Before that, there was no jumping. Jumpman was the first jumper. So Donkey Kong's a huge hit, and uh, Miyamoto's obviously a rising star at Nintendo, and his next hit would come four years later with uh, Super Mario Brothers. So if Donkey Kong invented the platformer, then Super Mario Brothers perfected it. It added so many things that we just take for granted today. The power of mushroom that made you bigger, the star that made you invincible, the fire flower that let you shoot fireballs and introduced a new mechanic to the whole game. I mean, that changing roster of power-ups slash weapons became standard practice not just for the platformer but for genres to come the name mario brothers is kind of misleading because in a lot of ways the star of the game is really the mushroom kingdom and all the secrets it has and that kind of thing what it did was make a fundamental part of the gameplay experience all the hidden secrets and all the interesting shortcuts and weird warps you know back in the day these things were exchanged by word of mouth you know there was there was no internet so it kind of created a culture around it no, another thing that I just love about Super Mario is sort of the introduction of the mini boss. And I mean, basically in Super Mario, you lay down a really nice uh, progression, a level progression structure. The level structure of Super Mario Brothers is kind of like going to school. You have, for example, World One, and then within World One, you have levels one, two, three, and four. And at the end, boom, you have a test, a mini boss. The mini boss basically tests everything that you've learned within that world. The final exam is the big boss, the lead bad guy at the end of the game, which is pretty much the culmination of everything you learned all at once. I mean, there had been mini bosses and incremental obstacles and, you know, power ups of different sorts across games, but no game up to this point had brought all those elements together and tied them together in this perfect completely realized packaging. It's hard to imagine topping the success of Donkey Kong, but if any game did it, it's Super Mario Brothers. And it's hard to imagine topping the success of Mario Brothers, but he did it again with Zelda. The biggest innovation that Zelda brought is that it drew a big fat line between the arcade and the home. Nintendo was no longer going to try to recreate the arcade experience in the home. They're now going to create a completely new experience that the arcade can't create. During the course of the game, you can actually build up your character. You can get bigger weapons, you could buy and sell stuff, you could find new equipment. You had to use a big map, you had to manage your inventory, you could walk around and talk to different characters. You could just wander around for hours and not fight anybody and not die and just explore this fantastic, gigantic world that Miyamoto had created. The game experience was so big 
um, in The Legend of Zelda that it introduced a new revolution uh, to video gaming, which was the inclusion of a battery save in the cartridge. Play for a couple hours, save your progress, turn it off, come back to it. This was a new kind of experience. Zelda could never have been done in the arcades. Now the other revolutionary thing about Zelda was that there was no score. You weren't trying to get the high score, you were just trying to complete the story. So out of all these new features, the absence of a score was that definitive line between the arcade and the home. Miyamoto had these astounding successes early in his career, and he just continued to follow them up with some of the most amazing games that the industry had ever seen. Every year, he would crank out new additions to these franchises. Zelda 2, Zelda 3, Mario Kart, Super Mario Brothers 3, Donkey Kong Jr. So every year, these would be the best games of the year. Everyone else was just trying to play catch-up. So it's not that Miyamoto was the only good game designer at the time. Sega had Yu Suzuki, who was also an excellent game designer, but he was just one that had the most influence. When Miyamoto had a hit, it changed the face of the industry. Miyamoto's games basically defined 2D gaming for 15 years. Then 1996 comes along and he defines 3D gaming with Mario 64. The big addition to Super Mario Bros. 64 was the introduction of a third person point of view. But it wasn't a static camera. That camera would move, give you different angles. You're in a three dimensional world now. You really need to be able to take advantage of all 360 degrees. Mario 64 is the first game to use an analog control. You couldn't really play Mario 64 with just up, down, left, and right. There were 360 degrees, so it needed a greater range of control, and that's where the analog pad came in. The rules of 2D are very, very different than the rules of 3D, and that's why so many 2D to 3D conversions don't work. Miyamoto made it work. Now, before Super Mario 64 came out, there were 2D games, and there were some pretty primitive 3D games, and some people liked the 2D ones, some people liked the 3D ones, but when you saw Super Mario 64, that just put the nail in the coffin of 2D games. Everyone then knew that the future of gaming was 3D. After the success of Super Mario 64, Miyamoto went on to, of course, release a number of hit games, Zelda Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. You know, he's still raising the bar. Ocarina of Time is one of the most popular, if not the most popular Zelda game. It's uh, pretty often considered the greatest game of all time. You know, after 1999, you know, Miyamoto basically went from being a game director to, you know, being one of the big guys, you know, who's basically overseeing, you know, Nintendo's entire creative output. Uh, but he recently rolled up his sleeves again and worked on Mario Galaxy and of course wins more Game of the Year awards, more critical acclaim. He is the one person that will go down in gaming history as, you know, the greatest who ever lived. He's been involved in more than 83 games. He was the very first person inducted into the Video Game Hall of Fame. Miyamoto is the first person elected to the Video Game Hall of Fame, but without him, there probably wouldn't even be a Video Game Hall of Fame. He's influenced the video game industry more than any other person. I mean, the guy's from the future. I don't think anyone knows that, but he is. <laughs> For hundreds of great shows like this one, go to onnetworks.com.